my name is Mete Navkiran. Uh, I am Associate Medical Director for Research at the British Heart Foundation. Uh, and it's, pleasure, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the October edition of our live and ticking uh, series of events. Some of you may have participated in these before, and you will know that uh, these are events where we share the BHF's latest uh, news and uh, research stories uh, with our uh, supporters, uh, such as uh, yourselves. Um, today's uh, focus is, uh, is quite specific on our early career researchers uh, and funding the researchers of the future. So uh, without further ado, what I would like to do is, uh, with the help of uh, just a very few slides, um, to give you a, a brief introduction uh, about our work uh, and the importance of early career researchers in uh, working towards uh, delivering our mission. So uh, with that uh, a brief welcome, uh, I would like to uh, get into my uh, presentation. So again, I hope you can see uh, my slides. Um, and um, as I mentioned already, the focus today is funding the researchers of the future. Um, but uh, before we get into that, I would just like to recognize once again that this year is the EHF's uh, 60th anniversary. And to point out that um, over the 60 years of our existence, EHF funded research uh, has already made uh, very significant contributions to advances towards better understanding prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of uh, a variety of uh, heart and circulatory diseases that impact on uh, so many people. Uh, this is a uh, this session is forward looking. We're looking to the future, but I would really like to uh, draw your attention to our web page, uh, which uh, captures some of the uh, um, advances that BHF funded research has enabled uh, and, and the uh, successes uh, that have arisen uh, from that research. So, if and when you have time, do please visit that website. Uh, and uh, do look at some of uh, our stories capturing 60 years of uh, pioneering research. Now, there have been huge advances, and many of those advances have been empowered by the BHF. But of course, we cannot be complacent, because even today, heart and circulatory diseases remain a, a very significant, significant problem. They still kill one in four people in the United Kingdom. Uh, they cause 45,000 premature deaths each year. And uh, in the UK alone, they carry an annual uh, healthcare cost of nine million pounds. And of course, in the world that we find ourselves in at the moment, we are all aware uh, that uh, actually COVID uh, and its direct and indirect impacts on people with heart and circulatory diseases and the risk factors for those diseases has incre increased the urgency of coming up with new and better solutions to these problems. Uh, while of course, COVID has also highlighted um, the power of science to deliver the really life-saving solutions uh, that, uh, that we need. And at the BHF, we uh, remain absolutely convinced that with sufficient invest investment, science will continue to illuminate the way and research will deliver the answers in, uh, in tackling these uh, devastating uh, conditions. The BHF's contribution to uh, research into cardiovascular disease is of critical importance, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And it helps keep uh, UK scientists uh, and clinicians, investigators in all forms, um, at the forefront of the fight against heart and circulatory diseases, which, as I mentioned, still devastate so many lives globally. We know from independent analysis that BHF funds 
more than half, in fact, around 55% of all non-commercial uh, UK research into cardiovascular diseases. And, and this support for this vital research uh, takes many forms. Uh, we fund projects, programs, uh, clinical trials and centers uh, through work that uh, covers everything from genetics, molecular biology, all the way through to clinical trials and studies in patients. Uh, where warranted, uh, we fund major infrastructure in the form of major equipment and occasionally buildings. And where it enables us uh, to get um, a greater, achieve greater impact, uh, we partner with others nationally and internationally through a variety of strategic initiatives uh, and partnerships. And some of those are highlighted at the bottom of this slide. But uh, I just want to stress that our biggest asset is our people, is the people, the bright scientists of all ages and career stages who we support towards doing the outstanding research uh, that they do. And our support for people ranges from those at the beginning of their careers, and they are the focus of our session today, uh, PhD students, all the way uh, through those who are at the pinnacle of their uh, research careers are BHF professors. Uh, and here you can see uh, a couple of our PhD students uh, and a couple of our, of our uh, um, uh, BHF uh, professors uh, on this slide. So um, in addition to the, if you like, the quantity and breadth of the research that we fund, I think it's also important then to emphasize that BHF funded research is of the highest quality and impact. And this is just one index uh, of that quality. This is again taken from uh, an independent analysis uh, from the science review that the Wellcome Trust published last year. And it uh, shows a, a parameter known as a relative citation ratio. Uh, to put this simply, it's just a measure of how much notice the broader research community takes of a research publication uh, that's been enabled, that's been funded by uh, the British Heart Foundation or any of the other funders that are shown on this slide. And you can see that in, in the domains of both basic science and translational science. So basic science is the fundamental discovery science, whereas translational science that uh, is um, the type of science that takes those fundamental discoveries towards uh, and into patients. And you can see that compared to other funders, uh, BHF funded research outputs achieve a much higher RCR score uh, in both domains. And this is relative to both national funders, MRC, NIHR, Wellcome Trust themselves, and international funders such as the European Research Council uh, in Europe and the National Institutes of Health uh, in the uh, United States. So I think such um, independent validation of the outstanding quality of the research uh, that uh, we fund gives us confidence that we can build on the past successes that I noted at the beginning of my presentation and achieve uh, uh, even bigger leaps forward towards tackling cardiovascular diseases in their many forms uh, in uh, the years to come. Now, I mentioned again near the beginning of my uh, talk that uh, people, the researchers, are our greatest asset. Um, a, a key formative stage in the development of a cardiovascular scientist is the period spent uh, in research training towards the PhD, which commonly follows uh, either immediately after an undergraduate degree or frequently these days following a master's degree. And I'm very proud to say that uh, the BHF uh, funds uh, currently 260 PhD students uh, through both three-year and four-year PhD studentships at 31 universities uh, across the United Kingdom. And by doing this, 
we maintain the pipeline of talent uh, and nurture the future leaders who will uh, drive the future discoveries that will save and transform uh, lives in the decades to come. I think it's uh, also uh, important to acknowledge that the seismic impact that COVID has had on all aspects of our lives has also put at risk our ability to sustain the cardiovascular research ecosystem that's been so productive in the past uh, and had a devastating impact on BHF fundraising income and, and therefore our research uh, funding capability. Um, uh, we are recovering uh, and, and we are optimistic looking to the future, but sort of looking back to about 18 months ago, uh, we really had to uh, take immediate action to protect cardiovascular research to the best of our ability, despite uh, the um, financial impact uh, that COVID had on our ability to fund research. Despite those circumstances, we continue to fund uh, our researchers uh, during lockdown, even though they weren't able to uh, deliver uh, their funded research projects. We uh, supported our researchers to join the national effort to fight the pandemic by pivoting to uh, COVID relevant research where uh, that was appropriate and possible. Uh, our medical director played a key role uh, in establishing uh, flagship projects to address urgent research questions um, uh, about the impact of COVID on people with uh, cardiovascular disease through the BHF NIHR uh, Cardiovascular Partnership. Uh, and those projects are uh, delivering some really very significant insights. Uh, we set up uh, an emergency scheme uh, very early on during the COVID crisis to provide time extensions to research projects based on need uh, so that our investments were protected uh, and these projects uh, could continue to deliver uh, the aims that uh, they were funded to deliver. And uh, on top of all this, we also took the decision uh, to keep our research funding schemes open and to be able to fund the very best of new applications uh, in order to protect the, the, that uh, pipeline uh, of talent and discovery that is uh, ever so important. In that context, I'd, I'd just like to very briefly uh, highlight the specific steps that we took to protect PhD studentships uh, because of their critical strategic importance in maintaining that pipeline of talent. Uh, we undertook early consultation uh, with the postgraduate research training leads uh, at universities uh, where our students reside. And through that consultation, we identified final and an ultimate year PhD students as those most at risk uh, from the COVID disruption. This led us to uh, launch a studentship extension scheme of up to six months uh, and uh, PhD students at 26 uh, UK universities benefited from those extensions, uh, which came at a cost of over uh, a million pounds. Um, we decided again, because of uh, their strategic importance to fulfill our commitment to fund student intakes uh, for the 2020 cohorts of our existing four-year PhD studentship programs through which we approved uh, 44 studentship awards uh, at 11 universities at a cost of well over six million pounds. And then finally, um, that scheme uh, was coming to an end uh, with that intake in 2020. Uh, just before COVID hit, uh, we had already launched a new competition uh, for a new cycle of funding uh, through uh, BHR four-year PhD programs. Uh, we decided to continue uh, to see that competition through to completion, at the end of which we approved programs, new programs at 12 universities uh, for four annual intakes from 2021, uh, the first take intake under which uh, our, uh, started uh, their um, training 
uh, in September this year, and that came uh, at the cost of uh, 5.3 uh, million pounds per annum, uh, and that's per annum over the next uh, four years. So PhD studentships are absolutely critical in maintaining uh, that talent, uh, that pipeline of talent, uh, and to uh, deliver the discoveries and advances uh, that will save and improve lives over the next 60 years. So I'd just like to close my uh, brief uh, introduction by saying that uh, with your ongoing support, uh, I'm confident that as the BHA, we can secure the future of cardiovascular science and continue to deliver the advances that will save and improve lives. Now, uh, we have two special guests today. Uh, we thought that it would actually be very helpful to hear these early career researchers uh, directly uh, in this session. Uh, we have uh, with us today Alex Ainsco, uh, who's a PhD student at Imperial College London uh, on the four-year PhD program there. And we also have uh, Amanda McCannell, who's uh, on a similar program at the University of Leeds. So without uh, further ado, what I would like to do now is to invite Alex to tell us a little bit about uh, his career to date uh, and the science that he is undertaking. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides now and hand the uh, lectern, so to speak, uh, to <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Thank you very much, Metin. Very much appreciated. So if I can uh, share my screen. Okay, um, would somebody mind just uh, confirming this is on? I think, I think we're good. Perfect, thanks Alex. Yep, amazing, thank you very much. So, um, hi everybody, welcome. Thank you very much for, um, for turning out today. Uh, my name is Alex Ainsco. I'm a final year PhD student at Imperial College London. And um, uh, I'm here to talk to you all about my, my PhD and my career path and, uh, and, and what I've been doing. So I'd like to start by talking about how I first came to the BHF studentship. So I did my BSc undergraduate in Hull um, 10 years ago now. And then uh, after Hull, I moved down to uh, Imperial College to do a, an MSc in molecular medicine. And um, after this, uh, a master's is a sort of pivotal time when you try and figure out whether or not you really want to continue on uh, going down the PhD route. And for me at that time, it wasn't the right decision. So I, I ended up leaving research for a while. And then um, I saw a post uh, that was a BHF pilot project. And it was uh, to develop a pulmonary artery and a chip model, which eventually turned into my PhD. But at first, um, this, uh, uh, this was a pilot scheme that was funded uh, for a year and I was a research technician and we got some really interesting data from it. And then the BHF uh, very kindly decided to uh, give me some further funding to pursue an MRS PhD. Um, so I'm in the final year now of, of this PhD program and uh, I've, I'm, uh, I've got, I'm finishing up in, in, in March next year. So, what I uh, study is a disease called pulmonary arterial hypertension. And what you're looking at here are blood uh, diagrams of uh, blood vessels in the lungs. So these are arteriograms. And on the left-hand side, this is uh, what a healthy person's lung would look like. So these are nicely vascularized. Uh, you've got lots of uh, small blood vessels. However, in um, uh, pulmonary hypertensive patients, you get this progressive loss of the small blood vessels. Um, and what this uh, essentially means is all of the pressure, oh, sorry, all of the blood that, um, that was in the small vessels now um, uh, backs up into the, uh, into the larger pulmonary arteries. And this, uh, this causes an increase in pressure, uh, hence the hypertension. And then this, um, this pressure then backs up onto the right side of the heart. And the right side of the heart isn't equipped to deal with this type of, of pressure. And eventually um, your heart will fail and that's the ultimate cause of death uh, in the disease. So I've taken a, a different approach to trying to, uh, to model and study uh, this disease. And uh, the approach that I've taken is uh, organ on a chip. So an organ on a chip is not an entire uh, organ um, on, uh, like modeled on a chip. It's, uh, it's more key uh, aspects of organs that you can model, key functional units. 
And in my uh, chip, we have uh, two channels. So we've got uh, a red and a blue one, and we seed um, different types of cells in either channel. And what that does is it recreates the tissue architecture that you find inside of blood vessels. And in these tiny little micro devices, we're then able to incorporate important mechanical cues such as flow. So this mimics uh, the way that uh, blood would be in a blood vessel. And part of my PhD has been to, uh, to develop personalized medicine and personalized drug testing, um, which I'm uh, currently undertaking a program of work with AstraZeneca to do this. And another advantage of these chips is you can, uh, you can also incorporate other um, cells that you find in the bloodstream, such as immune cells, uh, neutrophils and platelets. So you can really mimic this environment. And uh, it's at this point, I'd like to uh, put up my poll questions. Um, so my, uh, my first poll question um, should be, uh, um, the pulmonary artery is the only artery in the body that, um, that uh, contains deoxygenated blood. Is this true or false? I can't actually see. <laughs> Okay, Alex, right. I can see uh, the results if I, sh if I can share them with you. Oh, yeah, please, sorry, because I, <laughs> I don't see No problem. So the majority with 67% have gone with true. Ah, so, um, so yeah, so the, the pulmonary artery is the only uh, artery that uh, carries the oxygenated blood. So that is, um, that is, uh, that is, that is true. Um, so uh, the second question is, uh, do organs on chips model uh, A hold organs or B, do they only model key functional uh, aspects of organs? Great, the results are coming in, Alex. I'll just give it a couple of seconds. Awesome, thank you. Brilliant, so I can see the majority with 92% have gone for key functional units of organs. Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you very much. So yeah, so, uh, so we're just modeling aspects and the, the key thing about organs on chips is that they're incredibly versatile and you can model all different types of organs. We're just modeling blood vessels because, um, well, this is cardiovascular research and there's a lot of interest in cardiovascular research. So, um, so yeah, thank you everybody for participating. Um, so a typical thing uh, that I do uh, every day is I, um, I make my microchips. So these are piles of different chips that are, are waiting to be bonded together. I then, um, I then culture up cells in, uh, in uh, flasks such as these. And then uh, these chips, uh, which you can see on this tray here, are then connected up to a, uh, a pumping system upon which each chip is uh, on its own independent circuit. And then, um, and then I would analyze the, uh, the chip experiments. And um, this is a typical sort of staining that I would see of cells. So, um, so they start to align um, uh, towards the direction of flow, which is more typical of how cells behave um, in, in blood vessels. So this is uh, showing that we get a more representative environment in this microchip than you would do in a, in a static culture dish. And um, during COVID, um, what I did was I, I, I switched my, so I wasn't able to come into the lab as uh, everything was on lockdown. So I switched towards a more uh, computational um, side of the work. And I did a lot of uh, what's called bioinformatics. So I was looking at different, um, uh, different ways of uh, looking at the entire uh, way that genes are expressed. And uh, this was a really interesting thing for me because I wouldn't have been able to have, uh, have done this uh, if, if not for COVID and if not for the support of other BHF funding researchers. So I was, um, I was really grateful uh, for that. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I have been uh, supported from the BHF for many years, firstly as a, a BHF funded research technician, but then, um, and also uh, from my uh, studentship. But um, I'd really like to highlight the fact that um, when COVID hit, it was, pretty much that everyone was really unsure about what was happening. And um, there were a lot of funders who sort of um, didn't communicate to their, uh, to, to their students or to their other staff about what was, what was going on. And the BHF came out really quickly to say that uh, they were gonna uh, fund us with um, an extra uh, three to six months. 
and that really provided a lot of uh, of relief and of uh, you know uh, lessened anxiety and that was that was really good so I, i'm incredibly grateful for that and i'm um, i'm within this final six month of this extension now and it's it's enabling me to finish this final program of work which um yeah otherwise uh, my time would have expired at the start of this month so very grateful for this uh, so next steps just to wrap up so i'm still in the lab um, i'm submitting in march uh, 2022. Uh, in May 2022, I've got a, a job as a postdoctoral researcher at, at Harvard University, and I'm going to be working on bioprinting projects there, so trying to 3D print tissues and also to work on generating more organs on chip models. Um, I also have a, a, a podcast called Making a Scientist, which uh, is available on Apple, Google and Spotify, and I'm currently recording some, uh, some video episodes of this to put on YouTube as well. And then um, in future, uh, I'm, uh, I'd hopefully like to carry down the academic routes and potentially um, uh, become a BHF professor. Um, also, uh, not closing the door on being an entrepreneur. And as you um, may guess, I like the science communication, so I wouldn't mind being a, a, BBC, a BBC science host as well. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And um, if you've got any questions, please uh, post them in the chat. And yeah, thanks again. I'll uh, stop sharing my screen now. Thank, th thank you very much, Alex. That, that was outstanding. We'll save questions for later. Just one minor point from me that being a PH, PHF professor and an entrepreneur are not mutually exclusive. So <laughs> you, uh, it's possible to do both. So with, with, with that, I'd like to invite Amanda to give us her awesome. presentation. Thank you. You should be able to hear me and see my screen. Yep. Perfect, thank you. So I am also in my final year of the four-year BHF uh, program. I was born and raised in Canada and attended the University of Western Ontario for my undergraduate degree. Uh, before starting university, I assumed I'd go into medicine or nursing. I didn't really know what it was to be a scientist or what it meant to be a scientist. Um, so during my four years at Western, I took a variety of science courses, but the main impact to my scientific career was actually a work study program, which allowed low income students to work for the university. So I was able to um, work in an immunology lab, a medical biophysics lab, and a phys physiology lab during um, my undergrad, doing a variety of tasks from cleaning glassware to changing animals' cages. And these experiences gave me my first look into research, and it really inspired me to want to get into research and be a, a scientist. So the first picture is me on my undergraduate graduation day. And then after completing my undergrad, I did a research-based master's studying the fat of hibernating squirrels. And so the second picture is me at my first ever poster presentation at the International Hibernation Symposium, where I presented my work using MRI to look at fat in hibernating squirrels. Through my master's, I developed my passion for research and discovered the fascinating world of fat. So when I decided to do a PhD, I knew I wanted to continue to study fat, but also wanted to apply my knowledge of hibernator, hibernators to humans so that I could really make an impact. When I stumbled across the BHF funded PhD program at Leeds, it offered me not only the ability to apply my hibernation knowledge to a human model, but I was also really motivated to work for a charity. So I packed my bags and moved here a little over three years ago. So I mentioned that I have a passion for fat research, but you might be wondering why the, B the British Heart Foundation is interested in fat. And this is because people with diabetes are twice as likely to have a stroke and three times more likely to have a heart attack than people without diabetes. And diabetes occurs when sugar levels in the blood are uncontrolled. Diabetes has a number of causes, but being overweight is the highest risk factor for developing diabetes and complications from diabetes. When fat is working properly, it's used to store excess lipid. And when fat stops working properly, that excess lipid ends up in other organs like the heart or liver, which causes comorbidities like diabetes. So I'm gonna put up the poll question now, please. Um, I've said that being overweight is the highest risk factor for developing diabetes. What percentage of the UK population do you think is overweight or obese? 
So the poll question should be um, up and you should be able to select uh, which percentage you think is overweight or obese. Great, thanks, Amanda. I can see that 64% have gone with 63%. Great, that is the uh, correct answer. 63% uh, of the population of adults in the UK is overweight or obese, and that um, is about 35 million adults in the UK. So we recognize that obesity is a complex social, physiological, and medical issue that is a lot more than just calories and exercise, which is why we need to find a unique and new scientific solution to treat obesity and diabetes. I'm investigating how fat communicates with different areas of the body and how diabetes affects this communication. Our vascular system reaches every part of our body, connecting organs to each other to supply nutrients and oxygen. Our bodies release thousands of proteins into the bloodstream, which travel through our veins to communicate with these different areas of our body. When people get sick, these communications can be altered. I study the way that obesity and diabetes can interrupt the signals coming from fat. Having excess fat can cause excess release of certain signals from fat, which puts some of our uh, organs and cellular pathways into hyperdrive or confusion. And this can lead to a variety of consequences, including fat being deposited in different areas of our bodies, like the heart or liver. I'm interested in trying to block some of these more damaging signals that are released when um, patients have excess fat to try to restore proper fat function if successful at blocking these signals, it might be possible to reverse obesity and diabetes. So I'm now in the final year of my PhD and I've been able to determine a protein of interest that's secreted into the blood from fat and causes some undesirable effects. So pictured here is LRG1, and this is the protein that I'm interested in. So I've spent the last three years characterizing the effects that blocking this protein has on the heart, fat, muscle, and the effects to exercise so that we can begin to determine if this protein would be an appropriate drug target to treat obesity and diabetes. So the pandemic has meant that the institute I worked in was closed completely for seven months. Um, so I had to stop all my in-lab research. And although a huge portion of the work we do as scientists is gathering data, I would say the second major thing that we do is actually communicating that data. So during the lockdown, I took time to communicate some of the work I had completed so far in my PhD. So I was able to publish two first author articles. Uh, the first one was looking at combining multiple imaging techniques together to image fat. So it'd be like combining x-ray and ultrasound in humans to be able to see what's going on. Uh, the second paper I published was looking at uh, sex differences between males and females and adipose tissue metabolism, so how fat metabolism changes in males versus females. I was also fortunate enough to lend a hand in data collection and analysis for two other papers also published during the pandemic. Not only did I communicate my science to scientists, I was able to participate in a number of science outreach events to the public. So this included the Leeds Doctoral Showcase where I presented the Sexism of Fat paper. I was then invited to give a recorded talk of this work, um, which is accessible to the public. I also participated in Be Curious, which is an online public engagement event through the University of Leeds where I was able to teach families about the connections of the heart to exercise, and we even made a homemade stethoscope together. Lastly, I wanted to ensure that I continued to connect with both researchers and clinicians through collaborations. So although a pre-pandemic project, we launched the BHF uh, PhD Training Network. So this is a platform that connects all 12 centers that host BHF four-year programs. And this is to create a location for students to uh, develop collaborations and share resources. I was also invited to contribute to a textbook about fat in the heart, which will be used to train cardiologists. When I joined the BAHF, I took my knowledge as a hibernation biologist and applied it to human research because I wanted to increase quality of life for patients. Through the support of the BHF, I've been able to create lasting research connections and collaborations within the UK among many of the other PhD students studying at BHF centers. 
The BHF is also supporting me to visit a lab in Canada in the new year so that I can learn a new technique that will not only be crucial to my lab work, but also a new skill to our institute. I hope to continue my academic journey as a scientist and continue to create connections and collaborations both locally and internationally. Um, I hope that teams of scientists, clinicians, and patients can continue to work together because as a team is when we're most able to um, create their solve problems and increase the quality of life of patients with diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. So thank, thank you uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for that uh, very, very clear presentation. It was great to hear about your uh, research and also the other things that you're doing to communicate uh, your research, uh, as well as to um, promote and foster collaborations, which is just so important in, in, in advancing uh, science. So thank you for that. Um, what I would like to do uh, as we kick off the uh, question and answer session, firstly to say that please feel free to pose questions. There is a facility for doing that. And secondly, the team have gathered a, a number of uh, questions ahead of the event. So there are some uh, pre-submitted uh, questions that uh, the three of us will, will try and tackle uh, shortly. But before we do that, I'd just like to ask two questions. And I would like both Amanda and Alex, perhaps in that order, to uh, give us their personal answers to the two questions. Um, the first one is, you're both in the final year uh, of your uh, PhD projects. What advice would you give to other PhD students uh, that might be at the beginning of that journey, or may uh, even those who are contemplate, contemplating doing a PhD? So Amanda, if you'd like to give uh, an answer to that, and then we'll move straight on to Alex. For students at the beginning of their PhD journey, I'd say the biggest thing that's helped me is kind of create a team um, of people that you can go to when you're either having a really bad day or to celebrate your successes, because it's really important uh, to remember that you are a part of a team, even though sometimes it might feel like you're on your own in the lab for really long hours, but you are a member of a team um, and to rely on those people for both your successes and when things aren't going very well. Alex. Yeah, so to, to sort of like echo that really, I, um, I think that's brilliant advice because I was going to say something uh, along the lines of um, surround yourself with good people. Like I've, um, I've, I've had good colleagues and I've, I've had not so good colleagues and the, it, things are a lot better uh, when, you have, when you have good people and you have good mentors and that, that really helps. It's, even though a PhD in, in the end is very individualistic and uh, you know, you, you do get out what you put in. It is very important to work with uh, like some good people. And I've been very fortunate that I have uh, really good uh, colleagues around me that, um, that, that do that. And yeah, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, that's, that's, a, that's another thing, like reaching out to people. The worst they can do is just say no. <laughs> so, yeah. Very, very important advice. Uh, uh, and I've been there and you're absolutely right. Uh, working with others, relying on others, uh, seeking help when it's needed is, is absolutely critical. Uh, my second question, and I'm going to ask Alex to start this time, is you know, what, what hopes and expectations do you have for cardiovascular research in your field of interest? Uh, either through the continuation and development of your own work, but also maybe looking beyond that. So in your case, Alex, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. What does the future hold uh, in the fight against that devastating disease? Yeah, so, well, I'd really like to, uh, like I mentioned, I, I'm, I work on these chip models. And um, because they are chip-based models, there's a, there's a potential for automation there. So what I would ideally like to work towards is be, being able to create a platform where we can uh, where we can screen uh, therapeutics for individual people, because not all drugs work for the same uh, the same for all people. So um, I'd love in yeah 20 30 years time for there to be some sort of um, screening system in a hospital where people can um, get relatively quick readouts of uh, like functional readouts of um, how they respond to drugs using uh, chip based systems. But then, um, yeah, beyond that, the reason I also wanted to go into the bioprinting sphere is because I'd love to be able to um, 
quite simply just print <laughs> new parts, uh, which would be uh, seriously cool. So I, I, I'm sort of straddling both things, and I, I, I really see that's where the, the future is going, um, as far as I'm concerned, at least. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Amanda, over to you. Fat research is like relatively new in terms of um, scientific research. So I think to be able to continue to research the different areas of the fat and how they influence other areas is a really, really big one. We know in recent years there are fat deposits that are good um, and that we really want those deposits to be able to uh, help with the fat deposits that we might classify as bad. So if we're able to figure more about the communication and how those deposits are able to be harnessed to actually help uh, people, I think that would be uh, really good. So just more research into the different areas and, and how and why they communicate. Because um, we didn't even realize that fat could communicate or knew what, what was going on with, with fat communication until relatively the like, last 10, 10, 15 years. Uh, two brilliant answers uh, illustrating the, the potential uh, that there is in, in, in your fields to make uh, genuine advances. So thank you very much. Uh, I think at this point I'm going to hand over to my colleague Leanne, if uh, Alex and Amanda can stay on as well, and Leanne's going to ask uh, or direct towards us some of the questions that have been uh, submitted. So Leanne, over to you. Yeah, just wanted to say thank you to Alex and Amanda. Those presentations, they were really inspiring, so thanks for that. And we've received a few questions as well that um, maybe you'll help us answer. Metin, I think this one might be for you. So. This question is about how much money does the BHF fund into pulmonary hypertension and what type of research is carried out? Very, um, very good question. Uh, well, you've heard some of it uh, 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 from, from uh, Alex's uh, presentation. Uh, and as Alex has pointed out, I mean, this is a, a truly a devastating condition uh, for which there aren't really truly uh, effective treatments. But, uh, research is making progress, uh, and I do think that the future will be a lot better than the past for uh, people who suffer from uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, in terms of the extent of BHF funding, uh, I believe we currently fund about £9 million uh, worth of research in, into uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, and that, that funding goes towards a, a wide range of projects uh, and, uh, and actually people uh, as well. Uh, I mean, one or two examples I could give. Um, one of our BHF professors, Professor Nick Morrell, who's uh, at the uh, University of Cambridge, he has been uh, studying a, a gene called, uh, it's, it's a very long name, it's a bone morphogenetic protein receptor 2. Uh, let's call it BMPR2 for short. He's been studying uh, how mutations in the gene encoding that protein uh, contribute to the disease and taking that work further to see how that system uh, can be manipulated either by gene therapy or, or through drugs. And, and in fact is uh, developing uh, an intervention, a, a potential therapeutic intervention uh, that acts on that system called BMP9 as a, as a potential future therapy. And I mentioned to Alex that being a BHF professor and an entrepreneur are not mutually exclusive. And Professor Morrell uh, has actually uh, uh, established a, a spin out from the University of Cambridge to attract the additional investment that is needed to take that kind of uh, uh, really revolutionary scientific discovery towards translation and benefit, uh, benefit for, for patients. But there are just so many other projects as well. We have Professor Lan Zhao in, uh, at Imperial College in London, uh, who discovered the potential role for proteins that transport zinc. You know, you think of zinc as a, as a metal that I don't know you, 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 you make ducting out of, but uh, actually zinc is an essential uh, mineral. Uh, and uh, uh, their uh, research uh, has discovered that proteins that transport zinc into cells can, can play a, a very important role uh, in the uh, remodeling of the pulmonary arteries that uh, Alex uh, told us about. And they're exploring uh, whether drugs can be developed that, that, that target uh, those proteins. And then maybe one final example I could give, uh, Professor Mandy McLean at the University of uh, um, Strathclyde in Glasgow 
uh, is looking at uh, estrogen, uh, which actually seems to go up uh, in men as well as women uh, uh, when they develop pulmonary artery, arterial hypertension. So they're studying how estrogen and estrogen metabolites uh, affect the, uh, the development and, and the severity of the disease. And again, uh, whether that presents a, a potential uh, way of um, targeted treatment uh, in, in, in different individuals. So a lot of exciting research, a lot of investment, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm confident that these projects will deliver some uh, really uh, new and impactful discoveries. Thanks, Martin. And, and I guess on a, on a similar note, but for um, Amanda's topic, which would be diabetes, how much money does the BHF fund the diabetes? And you know, what is the type of research that the BHF carries out into this condition? Yeah, um, uh, a very similar question, but obviously now focusing on Amanda's area of, of interest. I mean, I, I think first things first, um, diabetes, as Amanda's mentioned, is a, a very important risk factor for all types of cardiovascular uh, diseases. Uh, she mentioned strokes and heart attacks. Those heart attacks can lead to a condition called diabetic cardiomyopathy, which is a, which is a form of uh, heart failure. Um, so recognizing the importance of um, uh, this area and recognizing the need for uh, research in this area. Uh, we actually currently invest in, I think, uh, in excess of 25 million pounds, so maybe closer to 27 million pounds in, in research in this area. Uh, and uh, again, a whole um, um, host of types of research and, and important questions that are being asked. Um, just uh, thinking about it, uh, we have Professor Jerry McCann at the University of Leicester, who's using advanced um, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging techniques to uh, study what goes wrong with uh, uh, the handling of another mineral calcium in, in heart cells uh, uh, of, of patients. Uh, with this condition called diabetic uh, cardiomyopathy and, and, and whether uh, interventions uh, could um, uh, beneficially influence those abnormalities in, in calcium handling. Uh, we have Dr. Chris Watson in, in Belfast uh, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, who is uh, actually looking upstream and looking at the epigenetic changes uh, that might predispose to this condition uh, called diabetic uh, cardiomyopathy. And of course, uh, close to Amanda, uh, uh, we have Professor Mark Carney, uh, who uh, is uh, uh, studying a, uh, um, a system um, uh, that enables insulin and, and, and related hormones like insulin, like growth factor one, uh, specifically in, in, in the vasculature and uh, 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 abnormalities in that system that seem to occur in diabetes and the potential for developing new treatments to, to normalize or, 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 or reverse uh, those abnormalities. So that hopefully that gives a, a flavor of the extent and breadth of research that uh, we as the BHO fund in both of those areas. Thanks, Matt. And that's, that's a lot of interesting research projects there. And obviously, a lot of uh, most of them are happening within the UK, but we've had a question come in. And the question is, is it possible to be funded by the BHF to conduct research outside of the UK? It's a very interesting question, I think. Very interesting question. I wonder whether that's uh, from a researcher. Uh, 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 I think two things. Uh, uh, first of all, um, most of our standard research funding schemes require that researchers have to be uh, affiliated with a UK-based university. However, that doesn't mean that they can't do uh, some of their research uh, abroad. Uh, uh, the, the key requirement really is that the research has to be of relevance and potential benefit to the UK population. Uh, because it's it's the great British public uh, that support us, uh, and uh, our our primary responsibility uh, is um, to the UK population. So yes, you can do parts of your research abroad, uh, but you have to be affiliated with a UK university, and the research has to be of uh, relevance to the UK population. Thank you, Matten. Um, another question that has come in is about. 
when did the largest research project funded by the BHF take place? Do you know? Do you know that? Uh, uh, oh, I wish you could ask me that question in about three months' time. Then I can <laughs> give you a, a straight answer. Um, uh, uh, we have a, a new competition which is about to come to completion called Big Beat Challenge, uh, which is um, a very large award uh, uh, to a an international team. I mean, it actually relates to my answer to the earlier question. It's we're sort of bringing in uh, international talent as well to take a big leap forward. Research moves by increment, as, as uh, actually illustrated by uh, Amanda and Alex as well. This is to accelerate that advance and rather than taking stop, small steps to take a big leap forward. However, the competition is not complete yet. Uh, and we hope to announce the outcome uh, in uh, sort of early next year. Um, uh, but um, so I can't tell you that, but what I can tell you Cumulatively, we've made very big investments to, to move things forward. Just uh, our centers of research excellence, for example, which are hosted at six UK universities, um, uh, you know, uh, in each five year uh, uh, funding cycle, these have been as much as, you know, six or seven million pounds per, per institution to cat catalyze multidisciplinary research. So. To, to bring physicists, uh, mathematicians, um, statisticians, uh, people, uh, images, people with um, complementary skills and expertise to work with cardiovascular scientists and clinicians to, to address uh, important questions. So cumulatively, uh, we've, we've, we've spent, uh, we've invested, uh, spent is not the right word, um, I don't have the figure at the top of my head, but we've had multiple cycles of the Research Excellence Award competition, uh, and I think accumulatively it could be close to 100 million pounds uh, over the past um, 20 years or so. Thanks, Martin. And um, another question is about what percentage of PhD applications get funded? Do you, do you know the answer to that question? Yeah, well, um, I, I think that's a very important question also. I mean, PhD studentships are absolutely critical uh, without training, continuously training the next generation of researchers. There won't be discoveries uh, that will ultimately translate to patient benefit in, in the decades to come. So we do prioritize PhD studentships. We have two types of PhD studentship. In the four-year programs, the studentships are um, given to the universities and they select the students uh, to appoint those studentships. And both Amanda and Alex are on those programs. We review and approve the selected students, uh, but they are guaranteed. So if, if, uh, if um, the university has a four-year PhD program, they are guaranteed the awarded number of students uh, to start each year over a four-year cycle. The three-year studentship scheme, uh, um, uh, investigators apply to us uh, with or without a student. Uh, and there, the success rate, I believe, is of the order of uh, 40 to 50%, which is higher than the success rate uh, of uh, other research funding schemes because of the strategic importance. Um, but of course, COVID has hit our ability. Uh, that number is a, is a, has been a bit lower uh, over, over the past year. Thanks, thank you, Martin. Um, I have a question for well, either Alex or Amanda or, or, or both of you. So, you know, obviously research requires a lot of effort and time, but what motivates you to keep going? You know, Alex, you mentioned that you're going to Harvard University in a, in a few months time. So what motivates you to keep doing this research? Um, well, even before I got that, to be to be honest, it's one of those things that um, I think it just stems from almost uh, a little bit of stubbornness within myself. Because you know, I, I start, when I first tried in undergraduate labs, um, I wasn't that good uh, at doing at doing things. So I, I just wanted to get better and better and better, and I wanted to be able to um, see the impact in what I was doing. So uh, I always view it as um, a sort of like. A competition with myself to try and um, do better and I just try and do better than I did uh, last month or last year and and yeah that's that's sort of the um, the internal motivation and um, you know the, the I suppose the sort of external um, motivation is that 
I'll make my uh, family proud. Um, I think that's that's probably probably it. Um, yeah. That's a great answer, Alex. Thank you. What about what about you, Amanda? What motivates you to keep going? I always loved like problem solving. So every day it feels like there's a new problem to solve if that's small or, or big. So to be able to um, solve problems and kind of motivate myself that way, because I actually really enjoy that aspect um, of my work. Um, and also events like this, I find them really motivating. Pre-pandemic, we would have groups uh, BHF supporters or charity workers come in and see what we're doing and come into the labs and I could demonstrate what some of the experiments that I was doing and it really reminds me what I'm doing and why I'm doing it so we're using your charity funding to be able to do this research so remembering that is a, a huge motivation for me. Thank you Amanda. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Thanks. And we've thank gone you. through them quite quickly. So I'll pass over to you, Matt. And to, to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, and uh, uh, again, um, uh, before I say my thanks, actually, I can see that there are still some questions uh, that have come up and the team will get back to you with, with an answer to those. I can see them. They are good questions, important questions, uh, and we'll get back to you uh, with answers. So uh, in, in uh, sort of Closing, uh, I would again firstly like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, I would particularly like to thank uh, Amanda and Alex uh, uh, for their outstanding presentations. Uh, I, I hope you will agree that um, they have demonstrated the talent and commitment uh, that BHF uh, funded students have. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't be able to support and fund uh, these uh, outstanding young researchers uh, without your support. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone in the audience uh, for that. And um, before I make a, a couple more closing comments, uh, uh, there is a poll question uh, which uh, my colleagues will bring up, uh, which is that has this event increased your understanding of how the BHF uh, supports the next generation of cardiovascular researchers? So if you could ask, if I could ask you to give a score uh, with uh, one being very little and five uh, being uh, a lot, uh, that, that would be very helpful. Um, so thank you. Uh, uh, so um, a re quick reminder that this event was recorded and will be available on our uh, website uh, from next week. Um, Secondly, we encourage you to give us your feedback and suggestions uh, for the future by completing the survey that will be sent to you by e email. This is very important to uh, me and my colleagues in shaping future such events. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, we hope many of you will join us for the next uh, live and uh, ticking event, which is on Wednesday, the 24th of November, uh, at the same time uh, when uh, Professor Elijah Burr from St. George's University of London uh, will uh, present uh, some of his research uh, into uh, a devastating condition known as uh, sudden arrhythmic death syndrome. So do uh, please, if you can, join uh, and tell your friends and family to join if they're interested as well. Uh, and finally, uh, if you haven't already signed up, visit our website particularly look at uh, our research success stories that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Uh, uh, the link to our website uh, is in the chat box now. And with that, just again, thank you very much uh, for your time, for your support, uh, and goodbye and have a good evening.